Patriarchy. White people are racist, all men are misogynistic, all cisgender people are transphobic. You, I love the mansplaining. I'm enjoying it. You're loving what? The mansplaining that's going on. With more crowded subway cars come new social issues. The latest is a phenomenon dubbed manspreading. I got raped. When my mother called someone else's daughter a slut. I'm reading <laughs> the face. What the hell happened to feminism? Seriously, look at this shit. What the hell is that? How did feminism fall so far from a liberating equal rights movement into a quagmire of neo-Marxist identity politics and man-hating? Short answer? It didn't. And the fact that it didn't is so obvious to anyone who takes a cursory glance at the history of feminism that it can be explained to you by a drunken New Zealander sitting in a shitty Honda Fit. Oh, but first let me tell you what inspired me to make this video. You see, as many who follow my content might have noticed, uh, it's been a while since I did my last video, and that's because, well, a number of reasons, but uh, one of them is that I was at the Friedman Conference in Sydney. Which, by the way, was fantastic. I highly recommend anyone and everyone get their asses to Australia this time next year and attend if you're at all interested in libertarianism, economics, or just opposition to identity politics. That last one being particularly relevant to today's video, because one of the things that I heard a lot of from the identity politics panel at the conference was the sentiment I started this video with. It's something I'm sure you've heard many a time from many an anti-feminist, that feminism used to be good, but something happened to it. Feminism started out as a movement for equality. It's since devolved into a crusade of aggressive man-hating. Third wave feminism is not, in fact, a movement for equality. Third wave feminism, which is the modern incarnation, differs from first and second wave in the fact that its advocates in the Western world have pretty much run out of things to complain about. Uh, women should be equal, have equal footing to men. Well, women then you're not a third rights. wave feminist. That's not what third wave feminism is. That's, sec that's second wave feminism. For those unaware of what the various waves of feminism are, there are the broadly defined eras of feminist advocacy, as defined by feminists. The story goes that you have the first wave, which was focused on women's legal rights, most notably the vote, from way back in the 1800s right up to the 1930s. Then, with the legal goals achieved, there's a dark period where nothing much happens, until the second wave, which is meant to be from the 60s to the 90s, which is focused more on socio-economic goals like equal pay and stopping domestic violence. Then, going into the 90s and the new millennium, there's the third wave, where feminism is finally supposed to have gone off its rocker. No longer the inclusive women's rights movement, it becomes a cesspool of grievance mongering and man-hating. But before the third wave, feminism was all friendly and just an equal rights movement and didn't do nothing, right? <laughs> well, let's get started debunking that rosy vision of feminism, shall we? And what better place to get started with that than uh, with the word itself? I mean, it is a pretty unfortunate term for a gender equality movement, isn't it? Feminism. To break it down, you'd swear it was an ideology or ism based on femininity or for the benefit of the feminine gender. Just based on the word alone, you'd expect it to be something of a female supremacy movement. But look it up in most dictionaries or ask a feminist and you'll get something like the theory of political, economic and social equality of the sexes. Which, as far as I'm concerned, is much worse. <laughs> Why? Well, imagine the type of mindset that would allow you to name your ideology of gender equality after just one of the two genders that exist. If you're happy with that, then one of two possibilities is true. Either you have some Orwellian newspeak going on with the word equal and you think women having more rights than men is equality, or you think that all inequalities between the sexes privilege men over women, and thus, in order to achieve said equality, all our efforts should be around benefiting women. The reason that this is much worse than an out-and-out -out supremacy movement is that at least supremacy movements will usually have an end goal. But a purported equality movement that is just chronically blind to anything that benefits women and anything that ever harms men, it's never going to stop. Since women will dogmatically be believed to be always disadvantaged with respect to men, always and forever, women will always need to be raised up at the expense of men. 
That's fucking terrifying. Not just because of the actions of the sincere adherents of that ideology, but because of the authoritarians who will want to use it as an excuse to oppress people. A perpetual victim class is a great excuse to institute oppressive measures like uh, attacks on free speech that we've seen of late, often in the name of feminism, at public universities, or even in the laws in some places. Looking at you, Nottingham. Actually, this gives us a pretty good working definition of feminism that seems to apply across the board. The theory of political, economic, and social equality of the sexes, with the unquestionable assumption that men are always and forever privileged over women. That definition pretty well accounts for the connection between feminism and the political far left. Of course the Marxists would be attracted to the idea that men are inherent oppressors of women. That sounds like it'd justify a whole lot of state action to fix, or aggressive collective action for the other sort, the, the ANCOM. My amended definition of feminism also pretty well explains the modern feminist conception of patriarchy. Essentially the belief that when you see men in positions of authority, that this represents a benefit to men and an oppression of women. <laughs> I mean, it's not like those men would ever use that authority to appease women and compete with other men, right? And this idea is not unique to the third wave. Patriarchy reformed or unreformed is patriarchy still. Its worst abuses purged or forsworn, it might actually be more stable and secure than before. The quote you see on screen is from Kate Millett in her 1969 book Sexual Politics, which is usually considered one of the foundational works of second wave feminism. And this is from someone living in a world where women have universal suffrage, uh, full property rights, the right to divorce, uh, let's just shorten this, they have every right that men have. And yet she still insists that patriarchy is not only still in existence, but more stable than ever. And how does she justify saying that? The concept of romantic love affords a means of emotional manipulation which the male is free to exploit since love is the only circumstance in which the female is ideologically pardoned for sexual activity. That's how. The entire concept of romantic love is male domination of women. If you're capable of believing that being in love with someone is oppressing them, well of course you're going to look around the world and see nothing but oppression. Oppression which only your ideology can solve, of course. And keep in mind, this lunatic is considered a seminal influence on second wave feminism. Primarily because of the work I quoted. It was work like this which inspired the lesbian separatist movement, also a subset of the second wave. These are feminists who consider existing in the same society as men so unthinkable they'd rather move to a muff diving commune. Perhaps it would help you to get a feel for the state of the second wave if I provide a few questionable quotes from highly respected second wavers. I feel that man-hating is an honourable and viable political act, that the oppressed have a right to class hatred against the class that is oppressing them. Robin Morgan. All men are rapists, and that's all they are. Marilyn French. To call a man an animal is to flatter him. He's a machine, a walking dildo. Every woman's son is her potential betrayer and also the inevitable rapist or exploiter of another woman. Andrea Dworkin. And all of these are some of the most influential writers and academics of the second wave. But in case you haven't recognised any of those authors so far, this next one not only will you recognise, but you'll probably recognise the very quote. A woman without a man is like a fish without a bicycle. Gloria Steinem. This one I'm sure you've seen before and probably didn't think too much of it, but imagine the gender swapped version. Imagine a men's rights activist had said something that essentially boils down to women are unnecessary. Yeah. But to top off this list, how about another from that lovely lady Andrea Dworkin? I want to see a man beaten to a bloody pulp with a high heel shoved in his mouth like an apple in the mouth of a pig. Aren't you glad the second wave wasn't infested with crazies like the third wave is? <laughs> hmm. But you might say that, sure, academic feminism was horrible back then, as always. But we shouldn't judge the movement just by what those crazies say. Well, wouldn't it be better to judge them more by what they do? Everyone knows second wave feminism was responsible for doing so much to combat domestic violence and achieve equal pay for equal work. Right? Well, let's start with the domestic violence thing. It's true that the first women's refuge, uh, that's the first domestic violence shelter for women, it was started in 1971, which is solidly in the time period of second wave feminism. But it was started up by a woman named Erin Pizzi. And Erin Pizzi is not a feminist. Here is an article she wrote called 
why I loathe feminism and believe it will ultimately destroy the family. That's... that's pretty damn clear, I'd say. But although feminists can't claim credit for the birth of the domestic violence shelter, they can claim credit for protesting and sending death threats to Erin Pizzi when she dared to suggest that perhaps men needed protection from domestic violence too. Pizzi, shortly after setting up and working in that first domestic violence shelter, discovered that domestic violence is generally a reciprocal problem, and a lot of abused men could benefit from a domestic violence shelter as well. Now, I know many people like to balk at this. Uh, surely a meek little woman couldn't be a threat to a big, strong man. But domestic violence victims are usually measured at around 40% male and 60% female. Not a giant gap. It's not so, too surprising either when you consider the fact that the physical difference in men and women can often be overcome by picking up the nearest sharp or heavy object. And you, that's not to mention the uh, fact that you're often in a vulnerable position around a significant other. And that's not to mention that men will often simply refuse to fight back against women because, as every boy has drilled into him, you don't hit a girl. When Erin Pizzi started talking about her findings that domestic violence tends to be a reciprocal problem, feminists went for the throat. They even managed to get her booted out of the very shelter she had started, not to mention alienating her from the domestic violence prevention movement as a whole, which is especially tragic seeing as how Erin Pizzi was one of the few who was, and still is, in favour of men's domestic violence shelters, an initiative which still hasn't really gotten off the ground to this day. Why did they do this? Well, you see, the dominant feminist ideas about domestic violence at the time, and to this day in fact, is that it's inherently a mere facet of the patriarchy. Any focus on male victims, or worse, female perpetrators, is seen as apologia for the male violence. Hence our confused feminist friend on screen right now. That feminist narrative about domestic violence, by the way, is called the Duluth Model. It was developed primarily by feminist activists Ellen Pence and Michael Paymar, and it's currently the most common batterer intervention method used by law enforcement in the United States and most other Western countries. It's pretty well summed up here with the quote, Domestic violence is the result of patriarchal ideology, in which men are encouraged and expected to control their partners. This crime, which as the statistics I pointed out before show, is not hugely gendered, is declared to be the exclusive result of men exerting their patriarchal control over women. The model is usually explained using this wheel. This particular one is taken from a Canadian police handbook, but it could have come from anywhere. So first, I want you to notice the use of pronouns. There's no pretending here. They are casting males as automatic perpetrators and women as automatic victims, making her afraid, putting her down, controlling what she does. Next, look at the segment at 8 o'clock using male privilege. This is not a strongly gendered crime, and apparently it's a function of male privilege. Okay, and then finally look at the central theme in the middle. Power and control, as opposed to being the reciprocally pathological behavior that domestic violence usually is, it's cast as patriarchal coercion. Tell me that's not every bit as paranoid as anti-male third-wave feminism. It's the prevalence of this model that's the main reason that men don't tend to call the police about domestic violence, and frankly should never. Because, as the statistics you see on screen now attest, a man calling the police about their significant other physically abusing them stands no chance of the police doing anything to stop her, and even stands a pretty good chance of being arrested himself. The Duluth model is something that feminists can claim proudly as an achievement. It was thought up by feminist academics and implemented thanks to feminist advocacy. Go feminism! The domestic violence legacy that second wave feminism has to show? Well, they didn't start the first battered women's shelter. In fact, that was set up by a staunch anti-feminist. They did, however, stop the first men's shelter. And they successfully ensured that half of all domestic abusers will not be held responsible for their crimes by law enforcement. Uh, but hey, second wave feminism is also known for their work on achieving equal pay for equal work between men and women, right? So what about that? Equal pay legislation was passed in America in 1963 with the Equal Pay Act, causing many other countries to follow suit, such as the UK in 1970 and my own country of New Zealand in 1972. All this firmly within the generally accepted window of second wave feminism. 
and I'm happy to accept that it was largely pushed for by feminists. But it was a terrible idea. For a range of reasons. First of all, it was addressing a problem that didn't really exist. So most people are aware that the wage gap nowadays is bunk. While it's true that men, on average, do earn more than women, there's no evidence that this is due to discrimination. If you take into account the different priorities and lifestyle choices of men and women, the gap shrinks to a negligible amount. Or right down to zero, or even past that, depending on how you break down the data. But what many people don't realize is that this was no different before equal pay legislation. The largest contributor to the gap is, and always was, that when men get married, they tend to want to, and or are expected to, provide. So they take on more hours and do whatever they can to provide more for their family. Whereas when women get married, they tend to want to, and or are expected to, raise children. So they take on fewer hours and move their focus away from their career. This factor alone explains the vast majority of difference in earnings even as far back as the 1950s. As Warren Farrell pointed out in his landmark work, Why Men Earn More, the pay gap in 1950 America was only 2% for men and women who were never married. The second thing I'd like to bring up about equal pay legislation is that it's entirely unethical. Uh, let's say that someone were to go around giving free money to people. Let's say he gives double the amount of money to women as he does to men. You might think he's being a bit unfair, but I assume you'd say, oh, well, it's his money, he can do what he wants with it. I'd expect you wouldn't want the government to come in and start punishing him for doing that, right? Okay, so what if he starts asking these people to perform some task in exchange for money? No, not that, just... Just some menial task. It doesn't matter what. But would you say then that he is now oppressing men all of a sudden? Should he now be fined or thrown in jail because of what he's doing to these poor men? Because that's exactly what equal pay legislation is. Now, I agree that sexism is unreasonable. I, I might even refuse to do business with someone who behaved in the way that the guy in my hypothetical scenario did. But it's his money, and he can do what he wants with it. I'm not going to demand that he be punished by the state for giving his own property to whoever he wants for whatever reason he wants. Anyway, the third and final problem with equal pay legislation is that it doesn't even fucking work. In the US, the Equal Pay Act was passed in 1963. And given that the very next day a woman would have been able to sue her employer for underpaying her on the basis of her sex, we'd expect to see the effects really quite quickly. But that gender pay gap didn't budge until decades later in the 80s. This implies that there's another reason for closing the gap. My guess is that the cause would be the cultural shift towards women being more commonly expected to work and earn, and men being less expected to be the sole provider. But whatever the cause, the idea that it had anything to do with the Equal Pay Act is just at odds with all the data, not to mention at odds with basic logic. You see, when you want to use the government to put a stop to something, you can't just magic it away. All you can do is provide a disincentive. In this case, it's usually monetary. If you get caught underpaying your female employees, they'll sue you, and that will generally result in a cash settlement. The thing is, Underpaying employees on arbitrary criteria is already disincentivized by the market, monetarily. If my business were to employ female employees and underpay them, then those women can just go work for my competitor at higher wages than I'd pay them, but still less than the men, and therefore my competitor outcompetes me. Hiring those equally capable but cheaper female workers at a lower rate, lowers their costs, and I just can't compete because they've got lower overheads, right? So irrational arbitrary hiring practices are just not good business strategy. Adding legislation to disincentivize something that the market already disincentivizes is just trying to fix something that isn't broken. I'd like to point out here that both the domestic violence example and the equal pay example fit perfectly with my definition of feminism in that they're both instances of patriarchy theory in action. They're both situations where despite all evidence, women are assumed to be the victims and men are assumed to be benefited. In addition, they're both examples of that dogmatic belief in women as a perpetual victim class being used to justify more government control 
of the market and society, showing that not only was second-wave feminism rife with the same ideologues that third-wave feminism is, but it was even used for the same purposes, by far-left authoritarians. Okay, so maybe second-wave feminism wasn't much better than the third-wave, but what about first-wave feminism? That's the wave that's responsible for securing voting rights for women. Surely there's no problem with women being given the vote. Is there? First things first. Saying that feminism is responsible for women's suffrage is questionable. It's generally accepted that the term feminism as we know it today didn't gain widespread usage until the 1960s. The main reason it had any usage at all before that was that feminism used to be a medical term. Those in favour of giving women the vote, aka women's suffrage, generally ran under the label suffragist, or alternatively suffragette, although that label was usually used to refer to the more radical suffragists, especially those associated with activists in the British WSPU, that's Women's Social and Political Union, led by Emmeline and Christabel Pankhurst. It could be argued that these suffragettes were just feminists by another name. But even if we grant that, this would mean that the women's rights movement responsible for suffrage was only fractionally feminist. But let's ignore that too, and just grant for the sake of argument that the suffragettes were the only important part of the British women's rights movement that led to the Representation of the People Equal Franchise Act of 1928. Well, this would mean that we might be able to say that the suffragettes achieved something for women. But they did so in classic feminist fashion, whilst being utterly, pathologically blind to the situation for men. Remember, men didn't have universal suffrage in the UK until just 10 years earlier. This right to vote was previously tied to property ownership, and only a minority of men were actually enfranchised. The 1918 Act was passed in the wake of World War I on the basis that men had been drafted into the army to fight in a war that they didn't even have the chance to vote on. Think about what the draft is for a moment. It's being forced to fight, kill, and in all likelihood lay down your life against your will. If I draft you, I hand you a gun and point you to some human beings and say that if you don't kill them, I will kill you. When, when you consider that, it doesn't seem so surprising that people thought that maybe those men should at least be able to vote. At least then they would have some small say on whether their government should enter a war that will have them forced into a foreign country to be slaughtered en masse. Or, as British Member of Parliament Will Thorne put it, and this was often quoted by other MPs in the lead up to the act, if they are fit to fight, they are fit to vote. So when just 10 years later, these suffragettes, these proto-feminists, were advocating that women also were to get universal suffrage, rather than having the vote tied to property ownership as it was for women at the time, did they also advocate that women share the responsibility that had been the justification for men getting that right in the first place? Or, as I would prefer, did they advocate that nobody be subject to the draft? Well, first off, the answer is no. The suffragettes were all for men, and only men, being forced to die on a battlefield. But not only that, during the war, before the draft was instituted, suffragette leader and head of the aforementioned WSPU, Christabel Pankhurst, led many other suffragettes to take time out of their normal advocacy and hand a white feather as a symbol of cowardice to every man they saw without a military uniform. Or, if that doesn't disgust you and you want something more to do with the laws, well, they also actively advocated for men being drafted. So there's that. That's why it seems fair to me to call the suffragettes feminists, despite the fact that they didn't really adopt the label. Uh, they sure as hell fit the description, don't they? Activism around women's rights and interests with a pathological blindness to the situation of men. <laughs> <sighs> By the way, um, there was a similar progression in most countries to do with the vote. I just used the UK as my example because that's where the suffragettes primarily were. Look, 
If you could put me back into 1920s Britain, I'd absolutely have supported that Reform Act. Even though the draft was the justification for men originally getting the vote, those two things aren't inextricably linked, I guess. I mean, a disabled man could still be draft, uh, could still get the vote, even though he couldn't be drafted. So if I were to say that women shouldn't get the vote because only men can be drafted, then I'd be saying that two wrongs make a right. I, I would definitely support the act. But if you then tried to tell me that the group which supported women's rights re the vote, but actively opposed men's re the draft, was an equality movement, I would, I would have been a little bit sceptical at least. <laughs> then, when you told me that they justified this by saying that society, which will see you die in a trench if you have a Y chromosome, oppresses only women, I would have laughed in your fucking face. Anyway, there's still one more stop on our trip back through the history of feminism. The very beginning. And it will explain everything. Charles Fourier. This is the man who coined the term feminism. He actually coined it way back in 1937, which, if we remember how long it took to catch on, means that he was over a hundred years ahead of his time. I know this has been quite an information dump already, so I'll make this brief. His general thesis boils down to one quote. The extension of women's privileges is the general principle for all social progress. That's all you need. Once you believe a society can be judged solely by the privileges of one demographic of that society, you have the de facto supremacy movement that I was talking about. Just look at the quote next to the definition of feminism that I gave at the start. One perfectly explains the other. Now, you might say that you don't think he meant that we should only care about women's privileges, just that when women get privileges, men will always get them too, so we need to only look at women's privileges. But just look at the society that you are in right now, in which women have every legal right that men have, but men don't have the inverse. I've mentioned at least two rights violations faced by men in this video. The draft, I know that's not currently in effect right now, but it's still on the books in most nations. And the Duluth model, used by the police and courts to deal with domestic violence. I'd say that the right to decide when you're going to die in battle, and the right to protection from a domestic abuser, are pretty important rights, wouldn't you? Now, I did say that showing you the origin of feminism would explain everything else about it. So, what about the connection to Marxism? the tendency for feminist identity politics to be used to expand the government control of the market in society. Well, obviously, the perpetual insistence that women are an oppressed class without ever doing what's necessary to determine that, uh, comparing that situation to the situation of men. Well, that's a perfect excuse for anyone who wants to expand the role of the state. Government needs that control so that we can save the women's. Eh? Huh. But there's more to it than that. You might think I'm about to tell you that Fourier was a Marxist, but actually he slightly predates Marx. He was, however, <laughs> and I'll put this up so that you know that I didn't invent this term, a utopian socialist. <laughs> if that doesn't scare the Fine out of anyone listening, it should. Attempting to get to utopia via socialism is going to end up causing one hell of a mess whilst perpetually trying to reach this impossible goal. So I hope we're on the same page now. Feminism is and always was cancer. Radical left-wing identity politics cancer. Third wave, first wave, zeroth wave, it doesn't matter. But I do understand why the phrase appeals, though. I mean the phrase, I'm only against third wave feminism. I get it. You want to be able to support the rights of women without supporting the horrible movement that that is associated with. But therein lies the phrase that I would suggest instead.
I'm all for women's rights, but fuck feminism. <laughs> I'm out. Yeah, well. Oh, and uh, maybe at some point add to that, uh, I'm all for men's rights. Yeah, <sighs> one step at a time. One step at a time. Uh, get the hell out of my shitty Honda Fit. Thank you.